Hi, this is Ashley Farod, and you're listening to Behind the Bio, the podcast about the people behind the professions. On this episode, I'm joined by B Smith. Now, B is the online editor of Hair Camera, a publication and online magazine that I'm sure many of you would be familiar with. If you're interested in the world of online communications, media, journalism, creative writing, then this is the episode for you. B is also a massive Canberra ambassador, so you're going to hear lots of Canberra love in this episode. I'd like to thank the sponsor of this podcast, Coordinate Group in Canberra, for making all of this possible, and I hope you enjoy this episode of Behind the Bio with B Smith. So B, hello and welcome to Behind the Bio. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's, I'm really looking forward to this chat. You and I have been working together for how long do you think? Years. Years and years. It has, now. It has, yeah. been, it has been quite some time. Yeah, for sure. Now in the capacity, I mean I've known you before I started doing the home stories on her camera, but we've kind of crossed paths before that in some kind of social arrays that I don't quite remember right now, but that's not yeah. the point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it'd be really great to speak to you because you represent, well, tell me if I'm right about this, but I think you represent a, a kind of new angle of media, a new angle of journalism, not only because obviously you work in an office that we're actually sitting in at the moment, which is, which is her camera, but you also, you have an understanding of how communications and media have really changed over the 10 years from being more of a traditional source of journalism and, I guess, newspapers and media releases to something that is a lot more social and community building. Um, but am I right about that? Do you think you're a good representation? I think representation? you're being very generous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that... I think you're right in saying that Her Canberra is a very um, has a very unique spot in the market um, in a number of ways, mm-hmm. and I think you're right in saying that it um, perhaps speaks to our current moment in time, where we are kind of looking at that intersection of traditional media and what you were talking about with Rosalie Ionelli yeah. uh, in her. Behind the Bio podcast. By the way, Ionelli. Ionelli, that's right, Ionelli. <laughs> um, that about how these days it's we also look at the content aspect of things as well, and content is an idea in and of itself. And so I think I think that's the kind of intersection where her Canberra um, meets is is content and news. Exactly, and that's why I thought this would be of interest, especially to those who are looking to get into the field of communications or perhaps working in it because I think you represent that shift and that change and I think what might be interesting is if we go backwards and talk about how you even got to where you are right now and you are the online editor of Air Canberra um, so it'd be great, kind of great to go backwards take the steps of how you ended up here and then let's get some thoughts around where you think all of this is going because I think sure. a lot of those who are listening would be interested in that as well. Let's do it. So let's let's go to the start. What you Born in Canberra? I was. Okay. Born and bred. Very Canberran. I've got the classic. My mum came down from Sydney um, and, well, she was born in Sydney, um, sort of raised in Canberra. And then my dad is from Queanbeyan, actually. So strong Canberra roots. Um, and, yeah, no, so so grew up here uh, in the inner north, inner north represent. And I went to, yeah, all of my schooling here and then I went to ANU. Um, but I didn't start in comms actually I wanted to do teaching um and by teaching I mean I wanted to do an arts degree in English and history and then go into teaching after that um and I actually sort of started getting involved in the media side of things at ANU through ANU's student newspaper Waroni Mm -hmm. um I did some extracurricular activities in my sort of early uni years and um, I went on exchange and then when I came back from exchange I wanted a new challenge and war only had been something that I had always wanted to be a part of but it seemed a lot um, bigger and scarier than I sort of maybe a challenge that I wanted to tackle but I sort of got involved on a lower level level I became a um, a sub-editor for the life and style section (laughs) a bit of a 
prophetic moment there and um, and then became an editor, um, which was great fun because I got to sit on a board of eight editors and we decided everything from, um, you know, podcasting to the content for the magazine and website and that was a really um, important sort of moment in my life being involved in that because that really shifted me. So from from the moment that I went in there, I kind of realised that I didn't actually want to do teaching. I was this close to applying for Teacher Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd gone through the sort of pre-selection processes and I was looking at doing that. It's something that I still think is incredibly important, um, regional education. Uh, but I had um, – had yeah had a bit of a taste of journalism by that point. So by the time I was um, during my one year editorship there, I had um, made a lot of connections with people uh, who had were doing internships, and so I did a few internships in Sydney. Um, and by the time I was I was done with that, I was like, yeah, I wanna I wanna do this. This is somewhere I wanna be. Especially I did an internship at Mamma Mia, um, which is interestingly enough, some of the things that I was doing in that role with some of the things that Amanda Whitley, our founder and CEO here at Hercambra, she had actually gotten involved with Mamma Mia back when it was just a, a wee little baby website. Um, and it was, yeah, that was a really funny moment when Amanda and I first met and we realised that we had been kind of, I guess, um, a direction, we'd been pushed in the same direction by the same sort of um, website. So that was, yeah, and so by the time I was finished there, I was like, right, I want to, I want to do something in this so, arena. Two questions. When you were at uni, so obviously you volunteered time or kind of got, got involved with Baroni, the, the newspaper for the students there. But where did the drive to be involved with that come from? I think it was um, – I actually think, weirdly enough, I would not consider myself anyone who – I never had the dream to be um, sort of like a, a you know, quote-unquote leader when I was younger. Um, but I really liked the extracurricular leadership activities that uni offered. Um, and when I had kind of reached the end of the road in terms of, you know, um, sort of collegiate opportunities, um, it was – it was sort of, and it wasn't even like a resume building thing. It was just that I thought, you know, I, I had no idea before I went to uni that you could have these amazing, formative, really adult experiences in leadership while you were still studying. Mm. And it, it as well felt very, it felt like a really unique opportunity as well, because I think at that time, and this is still being said, which is kind of interesting because it's been five years now that I've been at Her Canberra and then I was at Warren maybe two years before that. So about seven years since I've been sort of doing writing and been interested in journalism. And what everyone was saying about seven years ago about journalism was that it was dying. It was on its way out. Print media is dead. Um, I remember um, hearing about how Fairfax had – slashed its um, cadet program from something like, you know, they used to take in like 150 cadets over all of their mastheads every year. And then one year it was like five or something like that, which I don't know is actually factual, but it was, it was those kind of numbers that were coming out of the journalism industry that made me really um, hungry for any opportunity that I could to actually get involved. I think that my ideas of, you know, especially lifestyle journalism, it is a, there is a very glamorous, Um, sort of idea behind it but I think that uh, for me the online side of things was really interesting and that's what Waroni offered and so just any experience that I could get in what I was constantly being told was a shrinking market I was I was going to take it yeah it's interesting too because I think from those people that I speak who are journalists a lot of them had that yearn to be a writer or communicate ideas and thoughts, you know, to people through some kind of medium relatively early on. And they would look to opportunities such as, for example, writing for a local newspaper or whatever that may be as a means of getting into that. But it kind of seems like it was a little bit different from you. You were actually taking it not from the sense that you wanted to be a writer or a journalist specifically. You liked the responsibility that came with having a role like that and being involved in a project of of that nature. Yeah, I think it was – it's actually – it's interesting. I, I've written from a very young age. I used to write prolifically in the school holidays and things like that, usually pretty like, you know, silly stuff um, like uh, fan fiction and things like that, which is a bit embarrassing to admit now. <laughs> um, but I used to write a lot then. And I I wrote a lot as an editor at Waroni, but it was more um, – I actually just love uh, – 
the collation of other people's writing, which interestingly enough is the it's the role that I fell into there. I was the content editor and it's the role that I'm essentially still in now at Her Canberra is taking everyone's words and everyone's ideas and putting them into uh, and packaging them up for the public, really. Um, I love that. I love talking to people about their pitches. I love reading their pitches. I love pulling things together um, to kind of maybe sort of streamline the idea behind the pitch and then you know, packaging it up with images and then presenting it to the world. And that's essentially exactly, that's my role at Her Canberra is to, is to do that and to be that pipeline. And I just loved it. And I fell in love with that editing process and the writing goes hand in hand with it. And the writing was really natural to me, but yeah, it was the editing that really got me. I loved it. I still do. Um, the second question I was going to ask was around how much did the English and history component of what you were studying assist you with you know, moving into essentially writing and journalism? Um, I think that a lot of the time uh, it's the critical thinking aspect of my degree that I would bring into it, but I would say in terms of the actual practicalities of my degree, probably nothing at all, to be honest. Being being on a new campus, uh, being on any university campus was the driver to get me into writing and editing um but it was not it it definitely didn't inform pretty much anything that I was doing I have to say Um, I'm sure that it helped me you know writing essays I think um writing anything that requires critical thinking will help you in writing content that's not uh schoolwork but I think that yeah it actually it actually had very little bearing on it in the end interestingly enough did at any point when you were looking back at your degree so once you were kind of at Waroni you know you've you've kind of got into the, the board and so on at any point did you look back and go, I wish I did actually do journalism as opposed to English and history? Interestingly enough, yes. Uh, and that is especially when I was trying to get internships. Um, interestingly enough, ANU, and this might have changed, um, but ANU does not have a, an internship program like, for example, UC does, where um, interns are given um, the contacts and also, interestingly enough, very importantly, the insurance, literal insurance, um, in order to get internships. So when we host interns here at Her Canberra, which is one of my favourite parts of uh, of the, the programs that we offer here, um, we, you know, we take them on and uh, UC insures them. Um, and ANU didn't do that except through their national internship program that they run, which is much more sort of government based. And so I actually had to say no to really exciting opportunities because I wasn't able to get that insurance from my uni. Um, and so I think that in that way, I think it would have been really exciting to be uh, on a course trajectory that would have supported that. But it just meant that I got them in other ways. You know, I, I went did other things. Yeah, and exactly. And I didn't that didn't mean that as a, as a negative point in the sense that, you know, I wish I could have done that. Because actually what I was alluding to is that if you have the drive and the ability, you'll find ways of creating experiences Absolutely. and picking up skill sets and making connections towards the thing that you're really, really meant for. So really, you know, we could say English and history didn't help you much. It was this kind of hands-on experience at a relatively small, by all means, you know, newspaper for, for students that gave you the foot in to kind of discover your passion and the fact that you like editing and that storytelling aspect of it, of, of curating experiences. And that was enough, despite the fact that you might have not been able to get the internships that you're after, to keep pushing through to get you to where you are, which Absolutely. is a positive outcome. Absolutely. No, and that's exactly what happened. I um, After I uh, finished up uh, an intensive at Mamma Mia in Sydney, I decided that it was really, really hard. I was going up there once a week, going up to Sydney on the Murray's bus, and I thought this is really ridiculous I really need to look for something that's local Um, and I'd seen her camera around a lot but I had no idea kind of maybe what form that would look like in a kind of office sense and then I reached out to Amanda um, and she met me for a coffee and she offered me an internship on the spot they'd never had an intern before Um, and I yeah I think I started like the next day or something like that Um, and yeah it was uh, it was a really wonderful experience and and that's that's literally why I'm here today. Yeah. Actually, I want to touch on something you mentioned before. You mentioned that both Amanda and you went through Mamma Mia. Um, for those that don't know, Mamma Mia's got an interesting story behind it. Mia Friedman, and tell me if I'm wrong about this, Mia Friedman, she was a journalist herself, um, and essentially, in the, probably I'm paraphrasing here, but kind of got over it and, and could see it changing and also thought there was a new model to, to come in. Um, and as a means of that, essentially started up Mamma Mia from, from that idea. And now, 
now it is essentially a media outlet of its own. Um, but it's, it's, it goes across podcasts and social and everything else. And once again, to that point that I was making about the new wave of journalism and communications, I think Mamma Mia is a very good example of that. And it constantly keeps on evolving. Um, it is a female focused media, which I'd like to touch on later on, uh, as is Hey Canberra, but, my point is, both you and Amanda went through that. Do you think that's what gave you the spark to see that there's a change and you can follow a new direction and gave you that that ability to really fit with Amanda's vision for what her camera could be? Well, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Simply put, yes. Um, so Amanda, um, and, you know, obviously I'm paraphrasing her words here, but she often talks about how she got involved with, um, you know, she became friends with Mia, I think through Twitter and, um, you know, and started doing some bits and pieces for Mama Mia back in the day. And for her, it was um, the fact that she found that you could create an online community. Um, and so she had just given birth to her second daughter um, and um, poor Soph had a rather traumatic birth and she had been left with chronic lung issues. Um, she's totally fine now, by the way. I always say that when I tell this story. Um, and so Amanda had um, had to leave her job in the public service to be able to care for Soph um, because she wasn't able to go to daycare. And essentially, Amanda found herself um, very isolated. And so through Mamma Mia, she was able to see that an online community can create the same kind of bonds um, as a physical one. And it was really, and this was a long time ago, this was 11 years ago now. Um, sorry, this was 2011, um, nine years ago now. Um, so, you know, kind of um, pre-Instagram, uh, anything like that. And so she really found from Mamma Mia that this amazing idea of an online community, I think for me interning at Mamma Mia, it was um, seeing how uh, online content could um, knit so seamlessly together and have so many branches um, and be incredibly up to the minute as well. I really liked that. You weren't um, constricted by a print cycle. You were completely free to publish whenever you wanted to, which I found very exciting. Yeah, indeed. And I guess unlike more kind of standard formats, you know, in terms of newspapers having, you know, a long form piece and a short form piece, I think with social, there was this opportunity of providing content in so many different ways. Um, some of them more successful than others and, and all the rest of that. And of course, you know, there was this bad period of, of click baiting and so forth. But, you know, that's all part of that evolution. But indeed, it would have given you like a real wide horizon of things you could do in terms of providing content. With the interns that you have at Canberra, do you feel that that skill of understanding the community as opposed to the craft of journalism in terms of how the media mechanics work and how that engine of, of media works, do you think interns are provided with that education of that aspect or is that something that they kind of learn on the job? Interestingly, I think that it is, um, it, for our interns at the moment, it is so interesting because I'm technically, as a millennial, I'm a digital native, but they are like, they are so much more, you know, digitally native than I am. Um, they've got an amazing understanding of things like, you know, Instagram marketing and a really um, critical view of social media, which I think it takes a little while for other people to perhaps get to. Um, I think the thing that I always say about our internships is that, you know, UC has an amazing communications program and they have fantastic staff who are industry veterans um, from Canberra and beyond who teach fantastic programs. But you cannot teach what is constant constantly evolving and I think that there is for me and this is very much just speaking for me I learned more in a few days in an actual office in a media environment than I learned you know then you can learn sort of um from reading about it or something like that and I think that if you so that, you know I hope that our interns take away just a just a sort of you know a day-to-day -day understanding of exactly how a um an online media company works um and I guess in that way, but, but they already come to it with a great understanding of it is, is I guess what I'm trying to say. Um, so, you know, I think for us, it's them, you know, soaking up the environment and, um, you know, obviously the tasks that we give them as well, but they come so well equipped to, to do this kind of work. It's amazing. Yeah. So I guess maybe I'm leading to the fact that journalism in its, in its true sense at its core, which is, is definitely very much needed. And, and by the way, understanding the, the PR machine, understanding the, the news cycle, understanding all of that is actually very, very important. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that 
that change in the media has reflected in the way that journalism is now being taught. And it's both about the craft of journalism per se, but also about that, that building of communities and understanding how to harness that power and utilizing channels that are not traditionally media channels. So I guess that's, that's what it comes down to. Absolutely. And I think that um, the kind of hard journalism skills are what uh, they're learning um, in their degrees. And I think that for us, it's, it's just putting it's putting all the learning together really i think it's seeing exactly how that works it's taking things from the theoretical to the to the real yeah my my biggest lesson in all of this was i um i was actually always very scared of comms in a media sense back in the day i'm talking about a while back here and it all kind of changed for me when i wanted to tell a story and realized that if i put that first that was the most important part. And then you'd find the right language and the right tone and the right expressions and a character and everything else in that. And then you find the channel and then you build it that way. So really the, the story first approach, that's how everything changed for me. And then obviously when, when I came up with the idea of home stories and some other things as well, um, it, it worked. And probably one of the nicest accolades that I ever got was actually from Emma McDonald. <laughs> He's you know, a celebrated journalist in the true sense. He said, by the way, actually, I really love the way you write. And I thought somewhat of her standing would go, you know, the way you write is just, just, just all wrong because I've never studied what the proper way of doing it is. But actually what it showed me is that as long as you do have a good story to tell, you'll be able to craft all the other bits and pieces that follow from that Absolutely. to be able to tell the good story. And if it is a good story, people will engage with it quite well. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting the way that, that all of that's changed. It yeah. has. It has changed so much. And I think that the, the thing is that people will be, um, and I'm not, I'm not pointing any fingers here, but I think that people in general will be cynical about someone perhaps without formal training becoming such a compelling storyteller. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, people being cynical about influences and the kind of, um, the kind of cynicism I think that comes with any form of new media really, um, you know, like uh, people saying that oh, online news media outlets are like quote unquote blogs um, and, you know, if people are telling meaningful stories through Instagram but it's just Instagram and I think that that's just not the case. I think what it's done with new media has actually opened the door to a whole lot of people who would have been perhaps locked out otherwise um, or had their stories or their ability to to tell stories downgraded as a result. And I'm not saying in any way, shape or form that traditional media does not have a still an incredibly important place. I read the news every single day. I cannot tell you how important I feel it is. But I think that there – I think new media is important as well and I think that – People who tell stories from non-traditional backgrounds in any way, shape or form, whether that's someone on Instagram or someone on a website or someone on Facebook or someone on Instagram stories, there's still ways to connect with people. And I think that especially with this last few months, it's shown us that people are desperate for connection and for finding their people um, anywhere and in any way they can. Um, and I think that that's different to the news. To be honest, I think that that actually is really different from what we what we need to take in and then the people and the stories that we need to find and connect with. Um, there's been this argument that's been put forward that the, the rise of social media, and in other words, people spreading news between themselves in communities, was a result of a distrust of the way that classic media in terms of classic journalism was presenting news and, and facts and everything else. But interestingly enough, as we know, you know, that movement to, to social media then caused a whole bunch of problems in terms of fake news and other bits and pieces and being able to rely on that. And in fact, what's happened is then there's been this thrust back to true journalism that's very accountable to uphold that. And I think we're finding ourselves now is in this situation where we realize it's not one or the other. It's all about the perfect balance. And of course, in the myriad of things that are open to us out there, sometimes it's hard to know who to kind of pick. But I think having a balanced view between kind of traditional hard hitting journalism and what have you, and then also the, the social aspect and plus your own community, somewhere between all of that, you'll be able to kind of pick what is the sentiment? What is the truth? Hopefully, I I couldn't agree more. I think that it's it's 
important. One of my favorite phrases that's come out of COVID has been media diet. This idea of, you know, having to watch what you consume in the media, just like you would watch what you eat. And I think that that's very important for people's mental health around COVID and what they're taking in and letting themselves read um, just as much as it is important around fake news and things like that. Um, but I think that that's exactly that balance that you're talking about is you can almost look at it as in you've got the kind of, and I don't mean, I know that people will often see if I talk about light and shade, you know, we talk about the shade as being the hard facts, the New York Times, the Canberra Times, things like that. And then the light might be something like her Canberra, which is, you know, I, I think sometimes sounds a little bit more, um, you know, I, I, like I don't want to, you know, I, I, don't, I think that sometimes it can be a little condescending, um, but at the same time I think it is it is actually really important to have that lightness and to talk about, to read about things that will actually just make you feel connected or happy or just celebrate the place that you live. I think that one of the reasons why people love, love her Canberra so much is because we, um, we celebrate Canberra just as it is, which has traditionally been, you know, kind of the butt of jokes, I guess, um, you know, across uh, across history. And I think that really um, a lot of people just want to feel good about where they live and what they do and what they might want to, you know, eat or the people that they know or their favourite um, shops and local businesses and things like that. And I think that's one of the reasons why people are – we do have that wonderful balance now between the kind of hard and the light. I think that her Canberra wouldn't – I mean, we've never um, purported to – be um, hard news. We've definitely reported on some really important and um, vital kind of news topics in the past, but, and, you know, we do in-depth news stories about really important things, but, um, you know, we don't have the resources to be out there, you know, doing the in-person interviews, following up leads, um, going out there and getting that really, you know, vital photography in that same sense as something like the Canberra Times does. And that's why they're so incredibly vital for Canberra's, um, sort of, you know, news, uh, just environment, um, you know, we need them. Yeah, and that, and that's not what the audiences of Her Canberra are looking for Her Canberra to do either. I mean, it's almost like maybe, and I'm, this is from my own personal experience, but there is the news that you read to stay informed of the facts, so to speak, or happenings. There's the news that you read for a social aspect, in other words, what's happening around you in the community. And there is also now the psychological aspect, so things that make you feel in a particular way. Um, and sometimes it doesn't mean that it's all about feeling good. You might actually want to experience other people's stories to give some balance to the way that you perceive your own life. But I think those are kind of the three levels of, of the news that now sit. And I think, how can I in my particular space, sits somewhere between the social and the psychological. We definitely you stay informed of what's happening to a city, but you also get this sense of the psychology of Canberra and the community about how we feel about certain things, um, which I think is, is is very much an important part of any kind of place building, you know, and, and that aspect of it. I love that. I love those three tiers. I think that that's – and I think that's spot on. That's what we'd like to see ourselves sit. Of course, every reader is going to have their own idea about what they um, see us as. I find it fascinating when I talk to people we did some we've done some little surveys here and there and um sometimes people go oh I just thought you were a newsletter some people go oh I just thought you're a social media channel yeah. some people go oh you have social media channels <laughs> um it's fascinating different people use it for different things um and I think that different readers will have a different idea of where we fit into their lives um but we just want to fit somewhere I guess mm. oh I think you're fitting well um so Canberra You've been five years, mm -hmm. is that yeah. right? And what, what is actually the most challenging aspect of, of working here? It's a really good question. Um, I think that probably my answer now would be informed by the last few months, um, you know, just like everyone, just like every small business, we were hit incredibly hard by COVID. You know, we just had a uh, the first week where we realised that it was, you know, coming to Canberra um, and coming to Australia and it was just um, – yeah, it was, a, it was a shocker, total shocker, just like every small business in Canberra will tell you right now. Um, and it's been really hard. I think that um, our limited capacity is probably, which sounds like a really boring answer, but um, our limited capacity has always been our enemy in terms of, you know, we, I think that uh, it's a very positive thing that people think that we have a bigger capacity than we do, but we've only ever had about the capacity of, you know, three, maybe four journalists on staff um, or writers, um, you know, plus our, obviously we have more capacity when we have things like wonderful interns to help us out. Um, and obviously we have freelancers as well who we engage a lot of. Um, 
but I think that it's so incredibly hard to see so many wonderful things happening around Canberra uh, pre-COVID, during COVID, as we're starting to come out of COVID restrictions. Um, I think it's incredibly hard to see things pop into my inbox or to see things happening and to know like, oh, God, we are just not going to get to write about that because we just do not have the resources. At the moment, we're, um, at the moment we're literally um, – three people three and a half um and it's um well, right right now it's just you in this office <laughs> yeah that's right right now it's just oh, me and, sitting and here. um and so it's it's just it's it's hard it's hard to say no i think that's it it's hard to say no saying no is always the hardest thing but i guess that's because i, I presume it comes from this area of responsibility that our camera now feels in informing the community that we have around us and and if you if you can't write a story about a particular thing that's happening I almost feel like damn we really want people to know this but we just don't have the capacity and unfortunately you're going to feel like you're letting go of your responsibility a bit that's exactly right that's exactly how we feel about it um saying no is feels awful um and also it's also that really delicate balance though because at the end of the day um we've got to pay that our team um and so that comes from sponsored advertising, you know, banner placements, things like that that you see on the website. Um, and it's a real, I mean, that is just a conversation in and of itself, the balance of sponsored content on, uh, for new media. But that's, that's the issue as well is that, you know, we can only, um, we can only tell people's stories and I'm talking about like individual brands and things like that now, um, you know, so many times before it becomes an issue of, um, you I guess you are accessing our audience um, and leveraging the audience. And it, and it becomes this really knotty sort of conversation of, you know, like what's um, – it's so obvious sometimes what's news and then there are things that, you know, it's not necessarily news or it's to the point where um, – We've, we've told that story before and you guys would love us to tell it in a different way, but where's the line between you advertising with her camera and you wanting us to spread a very specific message? And, of course, then you get into things like, you know, the actual, um, you know, sponsored content guidelines, which are things like once the client controls the message, then it's a, a paid advertisement and things like that. But it's it's really difficult because you've got this spectrum. You've got this kind of, you know, what's our capacity on this should this be a sponsored piece? Where's the bias in this story that's being brought to us? It's um it's a real balance, and sometimes we um just it, it just it can sometimes feel very overwhelming to be able to know who to say yes to um and who to kind of um and who to have to say no to um which is difficult because I think um if if we were like a traditional media organization for example something like the Canberra Times it would be much more black and white and for us it's it's a million shades of gray and it's an e- every day we get challenges uh navigating that and that's not something that you are probably taught at uni though so, and that's the interesting part God, no. of it right no. yeah and I'm guessing I'm hoping it's getting easier for you as a team as you for, for every single time you have to deal with this you know, next time it comes in, you kind of go, that's what we did last time. We can stick by those principles. But nevertheless, it's an ongoing challenge for you. And, and I can't, I can't imagine it getting easier either. I think there's always going to be this, this, this friction between, I don't want to call it organic content, but I guess that's what it is, against influenced content. And we have to remember that we're sustaining people's livelihoods here. This is a business after all. But you have this huge responsibility of, of informing our community around all these events and other things that make us comparing. Um So I could imagine that challenge being yeah, quite, quite a tricky one. It is. It's hard to balance and it's hard to um, not uh, take every decision personally myself. Um, and I think that that's, it's, it's sometimes hard to, to disappoint people. Really, that's what it comes down to. Um, but you're exactly right. We're, we're sustaining the livelihoods of our team. Um, and I think that, you know, for example, if you, if you appreciate the journalism of the Canberra Times, for example, you should subscribe you should support them um it doesn't cost a lot to do things like that um and yet we see with a lot of traditional media um things even you know the guardian and things like that constantly you know reminding people to support because at the end of the day that is how they're going to survive and i think that i mean well look it's never been more prevalent than right now with covid you know taking away a lot of advertising dollars um it's you know there are media organizations you know just recently buzzfeed news for example um shuttering um around the world as a result of the loss of advertising dollars and i think that i guess it's not i don't want to preach to people whatsoever but you know i i it's something to remember, I guess, when you use free websites is that um, they're being sustained solely on the advertising that is placed with them. Um, 
And it's, and, and it's a cultural shift too, because none of us have a problem for paying for streaming services or movies, for example, you know, that it's stand on Netflix, Netflix or what have you. But I think with media, that, that shift just hasn't happened the same way. Do you know what I mean? And, and I think that's, that's the problem. So it's a cultural, cultural shift, I think, that needs to happen for people to kind of appreciate that. They're paying for the equivalent of a streaming service for the quality that you want in terms of news is just as normal as it is for you paying for Netflix. Absolutely. And, and in the meantime, magazines are shuttering. You know, people say that, um, you know, I, I think the issue is that people um, are really upset when, you know, their favorite magazine that they used to read as a teenager or, you know, I mean, the fact that magazines like Cosmopolitan and Clio and things like that are shuttering around Australia, you know, and a whole new wave with COVID. Um, it's, I guess it's kind of, you know, there's just one answer to that, which is just go out and buy magazines. Um, you know, just go out and, you know, if you, if you see a website that you really like um, and it's free to access, um, you should, you know, click on some banner ads or something like that. All of that supports the website um, in the end. Uh, and I think that if, if a website's asking you to pay for a subscription, that's a wonderful way to support. Um, but I, I, yeah, I guess, yeah, just keeping in mind the fact that, yeah, there is a team of people behind the website, really, and we, we all we want to do is, is do the best job we possibly can with putting that content out there and have people love that content. Um, but yeah, I guess that we've still got to keep the lights on somehow, I guess. Yeah. And maybe it goes back to the conversation we're having about those, you know, three different areas and having that balanced meal or whatever you call that around news, because I think maybe once you make your choices in terms of who you trust as far as a news news area, um, you know, perhaps subscribe to that. Uh, there are stuff that's always going to be free. I mean, Her Camera is, is free to read. So I think it's, once again, maybe for people to have an open mind about that balance and then maybe not be afraid of paying a few measly dollars here and there for the things that they, they trust in. Absolutely. And I think that if you have qualms about paying for things, um, think about what would happen if it didn't exist anymore. You know, um, something like the Canberra Times, if that shuttered, that would be a huge loss for Canberra. Um, and, you know, I hope that people would feel the same about her Canberra as well. Yeah, indeed. So flipping to a big positive, what's probably the best part of your job here? Oh, there's so many. Just there's pick so one. many. We don't have know. time for 12. Pick one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say the, the team, the people. Yeah, it's sure. beautiful. We have a beautiful team and it's just so much fun working with them. Everyone loves what they do. Everyone um, supports each other and it's just a really um, a wonderful environment to be in every day. See, I thought you were going to say something about the fact that you work for a brand if that is – exceptionally well known in Canberra as in that there's never been a situation where I have said oh by the way I write these these home story things and they're out on her Canberra that someone goes what's that which which is great because I think it's it's definitely been around long enough to really own its space um, and I thought you were going to say, like, no matter where I go and tell them where I work, people go, ah, oh, yes, you don't have to explain that <laughs> twice. But that's not what you did say. So. Actually, that is not true. That That's definitely not true. I'm, I'm that person <laughs> who goes, like, I work for uh, a website. And then they're like, oh, cool, cool, cool. And then they're, they're like, oh, what website? And I go, oh, her camera. They're like, oh, I know her camera. But the times when I say, oh, I work for her camera, they're like, what? All right. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't happen often, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, sometimes when I'm meeting new people, that definitely. Well, that I, definitely guess, can I guess happen. what I'm trying to say is that, that there should be a fair bit of pride, hopefully, by from the team, you know, that oh, what they've created over Absolutely. That and I think that's all down to Amanda's um, judgment and Amanda's vision uh, for the website. And I think that, and it all comes down to the fact that it really just started with her. It just started with her. It was just her in her living room on her laptop, um, creating something that uh, would hopefully one day expand to. Uh, connect her to like-minded women in Canberra um, and celebrate Canberra in that way. And I think that that just speaks to that sort of um, the core that we keep still at the website and hopefully keep that vision going in that way. Indeed. And actually you've mentioned something that I wanted to get into and that is that it was originally created with the intention of connecting the women of Canberra. Um, But it does much more than that. Does the her part of her Canberra is that still a major focus of the way that the content is either curated, written, the way that you see your audience? Um, I, I'm really actually interested in that because I, I get the feeling that it would have changed so much over the years. I, I, I don't know how big your male readership is, but I would presume that it's large and growing in terms of creating quite a balance for you. Well, this is a really interesting one because it's something that people often would like to 
either sort of bring up or discuss with us. And it's something that gets um, gets talked about quite a bit, especially with, you know, things like freelancers. And, um, you know, I've had lots of really interesting discussions with people who, yeah, who kind of just want to get to know the brand a bit better and where we see ourselves in that way. I think that it's it very much started um, – it all comes down to, I guess, the fact that it started as Amanda. Um, so it was her Canberra, as in Amanda's Canberra. Um, and it's expanded to have mostly female contributors. Obviously, yourself is a, an exception. Um, and one of a few exceptions. I'm very in touch but, with my um, feminine side, though. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that the main thing is that you're exactly right. As we expanded, I mean, it's, it's actually interesting. I'd love to know. I'd love to go back and maybe look at a week's worth of content and see how much of it would be completely um, gender neutral in terms of the way that people could read it. But I would have to say, if I had to guess, it would probably be 90% gender neutral um obviously there are things like um uh, I, I think the main thing to say is that i still firmly believe and i think that is and th- that's me speaking from this is me speaking for myself but i think that i my colleagues would probably share this view is that there is still a really there is a real need for female spaces there is still a real need uh gender equality we're not there yet essentially is the kind of the be all and end all of that conversation and what that means is that it's still really important for women to have their own space and also for women to be celebrated um, for their achievements, not because they're women, um, but because they're doing amazing things. And I think for us, it's incredibly important. I think Amanda just, she really set out to champion the women of Canberra and also write um, Canberran content and also write female centric content and they're kind of different silos I think and so we still very much champion women all the time we have so many profiles on amazing Canberra women doing the most amazing things um, throughout their careers and then we have um, content that is completely gender neutral I would say you know all of our food content, our event content, which makes up a a huge portion of what we publish, Um, our newsy pieces, you know, what's going on in Canberra, things like that. I mean, none of that uh, is, I guess, through what I would call like a gendered lens in that sense. Um, But we still very much seek to champion women wherever possible. Emma McDonald, um, who you've mentioned, our associate editor, who's amazing, um, she uh, as you said, had a long and storied career as a sort of, you know, hard news journalist um, with Fairfax for many, many years. And she had a great quote, and I'm probably going to mangle it, but she says um, that whenever she went out to find a story, find an expert for a story to inform her writing and to quote, she said that she would always look for a woman first um, to amplify those female voices. And she was always able to find one. So I guess that's probably speaks to what we're trying to do when we profile women, uh, you know, women in business, businesses that focus on um, things that are pertaining to women, um, is we're trying to amplify those voices and amplify those stories as well as just champion them champion them as um, successful Canberrans, yeah. really. Um, but we also, I mean, more and more we champion the businesses and the achievements of of everyone really um irrespective of gender um and i hope that that continues because i do i do hope that we're in that kind of stage now where um people of any um gender uh identity will look at her camera and not see it as just specifically for women um i've had many conversations with men over the years where they've said oh well I don't read her Canberra because obviously it's for women, which look, I understand it's got a gender prefix at the, at the front of it. I understand if someone looks at that and feels like they might be excluded from the content that's on there. But I feel like everyone, if they just looked at any given day on our website, they'd have something, there'd be at least one article on there that they would probably connect with in just a newsy kind of way, like, oh, a new restaurant or something like that, that's completely genderless. Yeah, and I mean, to, to the point too, I think the fact that you're celebrating the women of Canberra, that that's not female content. Or in other words, it's not content aimed at females. That is celebrating humans that's of exactly Canberra right. who happen to be female, and that is just as interesting to both males and females and everybody else. You're championing content that is balanced, um, but really, at the end of the day, it's meant for anybody that finds it interesting and not really putting that lens on it every single time. I hope so. And I think in that kind of way, I think that um, if there are people who uh, think that her camera is just for women and then they read it and realize that a lot of the content is 
uh, for everyone, but still have a problem with, say, you know, sharing content from a website called Her Canberra or looking at a website called Her Canberra, um, I, I guess the question would be why why are you so afraid of that? I think that that's an interesting one. Um, but also the thing is that it's not um, – it's just not it, – yeah, I, I really hope that people would not look at that as being a, a downside, the fact that it's got a female prefix on the on the front. Yeah, indeed. So in terms of perhaps not just her camera unless you want to talk about it specifically, but in terms of the scene of where all of this is heading, where do you think the next steps might be for the industry, for her camera, perhaps even for you specifically – that change that's still taking place, um, do you see things in the next couple of years that you foresee will be big changes for, for the scene of our camera? Or, or is that too hard to predict because it's, it's evolving in a way that no one can really predict? Well, I think you're right in saying that it's evolving in a way that no one can predict in the sense that I don't think six months ago we would have predicted that we're in the middle of a global pandemic. But I think that now looking at it through a COVID lens, because you have to, obviously, um, it's had such an effect on everything. Um, I would say that even pre-COVID, we have seen this shift towards hyperlocal. Um, which is very fortunate for us as a hyperlocal website. But I think even more now, people, um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that there's some kind of death of globalization whatsoever. I, I would, I would actually say that I get probably, you know, the majority of my news from the New York Times and then I would go straight to the Canberra Times. You know, I would go for the extreme global and then I would go straight to the hyperlocal news. Um, but, I think that people want to know they don't they don't want to know about you know the New York bakery that's doing insane cakes as much as they want to see a piece written about their local bakery at the shops where um, the family's been working there for you know it's a it's a multi generational family bakery and we're talking to them about you know what is the you know favorite slice that they sell hundreds of per week. That's what people want to know. I, I, and I say, I don't want to say people. I think Canberrans, that's what Canberrans want. I think we are getting to the point now. And this is kind of tying into all of that idea around how people have really gone inwards with COVID and, you know, the sourdough bread and the pickling and the. Oh, stop it. I'm getting hungry. I know. <laughs> and all of that, this kind of idea that um, it's people are sort of wanting to focus more on, and I'm not saying the simple things in life, but the things that bring them joy in an accessible way. They want to know how to, they want to celebrate the things around them and they want to celebrate the small things and they want to celebrate the local. Um, you know, I think we see that in the way that people want to spend, um, they want to invest in products that are um, Australian made, Canberra made, made in the suburb over from them. They want to um, have access to things like buy nothing groups. They want to look at um, community composting projects. They want to support things like the fact that we have some insanely amazing like Canberra breweries and distilleries here. You know, they would prefer to buy a local gin rather than a gin that won awards in, you know, London. Um, I think that that's really important. Uh, that's a really important shift that's been happening over the last few years and through COVID, I think even more so because people are realizing that while we are more connected than ever globally, and we've seen that obviously with the, the shutdown of our global connections due to COVID, um, I think that people are realizing that um, they just really want to see what's going on in their own backyard. And that's really lucky for her camera because that's what we focus on. But I think that at the end of the day, um, we're looking to that. It's almost more drifting in your wonderful three tier system down towards that more psychological, what's making us feel good. And it's kind of that what, ma what makes us feel good is the stuff that makes us feel a part of something and stuff that makes us feel connected. Mm. And there used to be this catch cry, you know, probably about five years ago, about content is king. You know, a lot of people said that, just just churn stuff out, churn stuff out, because we need content. And I think very quickly that changed to what I would now argue is relevance is king. And things that are local that you can actually have an ability to interact with or have some impact on is more relevant than something that's very distant from you. Um, being aware of the stuff that's distant from you is very important because it shapes your world vision and ultimately therefore your local vision but the point being is is being relevant and being local is, is definitely the way to go and I guess you know Hey Canberra plays a part in that but I think even taking it outside of Hey Canberra 
anybody that's interested in the com space, if they have that filter on everything that they do, it's more likely to engage than, than something else. I think so. And I think that with the rise of Instagram, we're getting to know people on a much more granular level. And I think that people are realizing that everyday people are some of the most fascinating people. You know, you see that with the rise of things like Humans of New York. You know, we don't necessarily read, we don't read global or national publications as much anymore, I want to say, because I I still think it's very important to read them. Um, But we, you know, I think that people are turning away from the global idea of these are the 100 most fascinating people in the world to um, here are 10 Canberrans who you might have come across at your local shops and look at these amazing things that they're doing. People want to get to know other humans on a really micro level um, and to see what's happening around them instead of looking outward. I think we're looking inward. Yeah, and if, and if there's any place to do that in, it's, it's, it's Canberra. Mm, exactly. <laughs> And, and what about yourself? Um, I mean, I, this is not a job interview, so I don't want to say, hey, what's on the plan for five to ten years' time? But do you see yourself being in Canberra, say, in, in ten years' time? Or, or do you think you, all those interests that you have and, you know, the, the, the challenges you want to take on, do you think they'll take you out of, out of this place to somewhere else? Yeah, it's a really fascinating question because I think that I am someone who has always been looking outward from Canberra. Um, probably pre up to the point where I started working at Her Canberra, my view was very outward. Um, I loved international publications. My favorite magazine was LUK. Um, I loved travel. I mean, I still love travel, but I, you know, it's, it's that kind of, I was always looking outward. Um, my whole family is very, we're like a whole bunch of like Europhiles slash what is even, I don't know what the file is for Britain, but, you know, <laughs> super Anglophile, Anglophile, <laughs> super, yeah. And so, you know, it just, I always wanted to travel. I saw myself living overseas and working. Um, and it's just been fascinating because as I have worked for a company that champions local, I myself have become someone who's realized how incredibly good we've got it here in Canberra. And that's just, you know, we're in an incredibly privileged bunch of people to just be here. And oh gosh, I mean, you know, obviously during COVID, it's it's no more obvious. We've been so incredibly lucky with the way that everything's been handled, with the way that people stuck to social distancing, physical distancing so well that we've got, you know, we've not had any cases. I'm able to hug my grandma. How amazing. Um, you know, it's it's like, you know, every time I think like, oh, the grass just might be greener somewhere else. I just realize like how how good we've got it here in Canberra and how good I've personally got it here in Canberra, I think. Um, one of the things that – and I'm also very lucky as well in that my um, – I guess my big sort of career aspirations would be uh, lucky in that I think my um, – and I would have mentioned this when we were on the, the panel discussion at Keep Co. a yeah. little while ago. Um, I would really love to have some fiction published, and that's something that I do in my spare time. Um, and that provides a very neat sort of little fork for me in career aspiration because I can stay exactly where I am and be on this career trajectory that I am on now and doing amazing things with her Canberra um, and still be doing stuff in my spare time that puts that pushes towards this completely uh, different career aspiration which is to to become a published fiction writer in that way so or to just write a whole lot of non-published <laughs> fiction novels um so I'm, I'm lucky in that sense because my big I realized that a few years ago when I was first writing my first novel I was like oh my god it's like it's like writing that kind of stuff is like crack to me like it's just <laughs> it's amazing like I love it so much it really it fuels me it drives me and really nourishes me and I realized that I can actually do both at once so it's kind of in a way I'm kind of already while still being here doing stuff um you know still being on this same career path that I am now I'm I'm also forging another career path in my spare time that I think will always be a spare time kind of you know career hobby um but it it is nourishing enough that I can stay exactly where I am but feel like I'm also you know um moving in a very different direction at the same time which feels really fresh that's awesome the that second pursuit around the, the writing, is that downtime or do you need downtime on top of that as well? In other words, how do you relax? Do you find switching from one form of writing to another form of writing relaxing or that's the same part of the brain and eventually you go, no, 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 I've got to do something else and you relax by doing 
X. That's a really fascinating question because that was probably what stopped me from writing fiction for a, a number of years. Um, I always knew that I wanted to write novels. Um, as I said, I wrote a lot when I was a teenager especially. And I think that when I started working as a writer for my job, an editor, it was really hard for my brain to go, you know, I just said I just can't do both, just can't do both. And I don't even think that I really tried. I just said that I couldn't do both um, to myself. And it wasn't until I actually had a particular spark of an idea and I sat down and I started to create a funnel all of my free time into doing this project that I realized, oh my God, I can actually do both. I, I really struggle doing both um, in the same day. I really, I don't do writing in the morning. I don't do fiction in the morning or at night times. It's pretty much just on weekends, but, um, but it is, it is downtime. That is a lot of how I relax. I also get really, it's kind of like, um, this sounds really, I don't want to sound like a total wanker, but it is also really almost like a bit of a, um, a bit of a need as well, like a bit of an outlet. And I, I actually get quite, um, I get a little bit, I think, um, grumpy and a bit crabby if I haven't written, um, or, you know, had a good amount of time on a weekend, um, which sounds really precious, but I, I've noticed that, um, in terms of other downtime, um, uh, it might, surprise people to know that I don't read a lot at all I haven't picked up a single book during COVID it's so bad I feel terrible saying that um but I yeah Netflix for Mm. sure um going on walks hanging out with family I live with my family at the moment my sister and my parents and my grandmother who lives in a granny flat out the back with her small dog. All right. So it's a big rambling household right now. Um, I'm also really lucky in that all of my really close friends are still here in Canberra. Um, I see them as often as I possibly can. And I'm also really lucky in the sense that all of them have really um, – a lot of them are either studying or they've got kind of side hustles um, or they've got a business like our mutual friend Anna Trundle of Keepco and they're uh, hustling to build these businesses. Um, and so it's a very unique and excellent situation for me to be in because I can hang out with them while we're all working on our various projects and kind of do two, you know, two at once, which is awesome. Um, and so, yeah, so friends, family, Netflix. <laughs> yeah. I do get the feeling that you get a lot out of social situations. I mean, apart from oh, – in fact, actually, I don't think I almost ever see you specifically to do with like home stories. I, I think I just email you and we, and we discuss things that way. So we almost never have professional meetings about that. But I keep on seeing you out exactly at different social situations. Sometimes they're launches and they're obviously representing here camera. But then sometimes you just hang around in spaces and, and I presume you're getting – inspiration for the things that you're working on um and I, I get the feeling that you kind of quite like that sense of community amongst you know the people that you're connected with which is probably keeping you quite grounded to this place as well that's it yeah i, I definitely i'm very uh, i feel very con- I, I feel lucky that a lot of my friends are in that same stage of our lives where we're really yeah. um we're working silly hours but we're all uh we're working towards something that we really believe in and that we really love whether that's you know a second degree or a business or a side hustle or whatever and that definitely it it doesn't just keep you grounded I think what it does is it it tells you that you're not alone in wanting to do something that maybe isn't just your nine to five um which is so important I think because a lot of the time a lot of people have a self-doubt um especially around diverging diverging from their actual career path in terms of, you know, dedicating hours and hours of your weekends to a side hustle that might not eventuate into anything. And having those people around, there's nothing better to convince you that, no, no, you can give that a crack. Like, absolutely. If they're doing it, you can do it. And it's, um, yeah, it's a very fulfilling thing to be around, I think. Yeah. I, I think encouraging people to follow whatever the second – third fourth passion depending who they are and, and really give it a good go is, is 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 a great idea i mean it's it's hard people have busy lives children whatever else health issues other concerns and sometimes it's very hard to fit in but i think the encouragement you can give to people is that if you love something enough you will find time to squish that in somewhere I agree. And then and then you'll get a real reward out of it. And even if it doesn't end up being the thing that you planned all along for it to be, you will still feel internally rewarded for the fact that you gave it a go. I, I think that's 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 the main part of it. So 
Yeah, my follow that side hustle dream, everybody. That's right. <laughs> hustle, hustle hard, everyone. <laughs> hustle hard. Look, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate this conversation that we had. I, I think it's actually going to be quite insightful to a lot of people, those who read Hair Canberra, those who are probably trying to get into the industry, those who are trying to make sense of the world out there in terms of all that content that's, that's coming at them. So I think we've touched on quite a few different things that might relate to different people i hope so i and, hope so and we did definitely did a very great plug for canberra i think visit canberra will call me after this and might sleep me at 50 for all the uh, for all the work you've got my number guys 50, 100 oh that's we need to split it sorry we'll make that 100 <laughs> i'm pretty cheap yeah. thank you so much for having me actually all right I'm, I'm sure i'll see you at the next social occasion even though we might not be able to hug as such that's right four meters per person <laughs> four meters per person all right take care Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with B. Smith. And as always, I would love to hear what you thought. You can reach me on Instagram at Behind the Bio Podcast or by good old fashioned email Ashley underscore Farod at Outlook.com. I would love to hear from you. If you enjoyed the episode, please share, suggest it to your friends, or perhaps tune into the new ones. There are many more to come. Once again, thank you to the Coordinate Group in Canberra for making this possible, and I hope to catch you at the next episode of Behind the Bio.